countdown continues. Meanwhile, let us move on to our next speaker, by the, a gentleman by the name of Daniel Greenfield. He's an author and columnist born in Israel, living in Los Angeles now, and he is a Shilman Journalism Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. What a great organization. He writes on, exactly, he writes on such topics as terrorism and socialism at the center's website, Front Page Magazine, as well as his own blog, Sultan Kanish. You can't, you can't forget that one. He's the Sultan Kanish, folks. And in columns that are syndicated elsewhere across the wide, vast expanses of the Internet. He, was a column, he had a column titled Western Front at Israel National News. And his op-eds have also appeared in the New York Sun, the Jewish Press, and at Fox Nation. He was named one of the Jewish Press's most worthwhile blogs from 2006 through 2011. His investigative pieces detailed for the first time many of Obama's radical clergy ties, including Farrakhan supporters, as well as exposing rabbis for Obama as being a front page group for pro-Hamas appeasement supporters. He revealed that the vice president of the Center for American Progress and the new senior advisor for Nancy Pelosi had participated in terrorist fundraising. He investigated the billionaires funding the anti-Israel left, the Islamic misogyny in the new French government, the cover-up Islamic genocide in Nigeria, and lost history of Harlem's black Hitler. The scope of Daniel's writings covers everything from domestic American politics to creeping Islamism and how foreign aid makes its way into the hands of terrorists to white aborigines in Australia, Islamist imams in Libya, flogging in Maldives, and hunt for witches in the Muslim world. Ladies and gentlemen, what a great author to have for you and a great spokesperson. Give a warm South Carolinian welcome to Daniel Greenfield. This is not yours, right? No. Hey, hello, everyone. I hope you're feeling really good after the coffee break because I'm about to make you feel really bad. See, Evan and I have a little arrangement. He makes everybody feel good and laugh, and then I come in and I make everybody feel bad and down, and then they need him again. I'm like his comedy drug dealer. <laughs> I can understand why people aren't drifting back from the coffee break, because this speech is about a civil war, and who wants to be in a civil war? I don't want to be in a civil war. I don't think anybody here wants to be in a civil war. But we're in a civil war anyway, whether or not we want to be in one. And that's the problem here. Now, you might be thinking civil war is not a little over the top, I mean, we're in South Carolina, there's a great history of the Civil War here, and we don't have any men with cannons in the street, there are no soldiers in blue and gray stabbing each other, nobody's shooting each other in the streets except, you know, in Chicago and Baltimore and St. Louis and Washington, D.C., but that's not a civil war, that's just what happens when Democrats take over a city and run into the ground, and then they dig an even bigger hole to bury it even deeper in the ground. And if you look big and far enough into that Democrat hole, you might even see where Jimmy Hoffa's buried. <laughs> that's not a civil war, though. That's just Democrats being Democrats. But we do have a civil war. And why do I call it a civil war when there's no fighting in the streets? What is a civil war really about? It's not about the guns. When you are actually shooting each other, that's how a civil war ends. That's the beginning of the end, one way or another. A civil war begins with politics. Exactly. It's about who's in power. Quite correct. That's why we're having a civil war now. Now, when you have a normal disagreement within the government, you decide it using a system of elections. That's what we normally have. You don't like this party, you wait four years, you run as hard as you can, and you win. And then somebody else does it again. You have what we like to call a peaceful transfer of power. This time around, we didn't exactly have a peaceful transfer of power. Instead, we had rioting in the streets, um, we had people screaming at the sky, uh, but more seriously than that, more seriously than the rioting or the violence, we had organizations within the government, some people call them the deep state or the shadow government, whatever you want to call them, who are determined that they're the ones who are going to be in power. Sometimes they're subtle about it when they're within the bureaucracy. Sometimes they're very obvious about it, such as when federal judges announce that President Trump has no right to set any policies whatsoever that they disagree with. That's effectively a civil war. There may not be any shooting, but there's a power struggle. There's a struggle for control of the government. And it's a struggle that's not determined by elections. Just because President Trump won an election doesn't mean that he should actually be able to run the country. I mean, he just won an election. Who cares? They're the ones who are actually in power year to year, decade to decade. That's what we're dealing with here. Now, 
This is not the first time this happened. I know some people have referenced things. How many people here are old enough to remember this? How many people are old enough to remember that? How many people are old enough to remember the first time a Republican president won an election this century? What happened after that election? Did the Democrats say, well, we fought a good campaign. President Bush won the election. We should now recognize him and work with him. No, they said, he didn't really win the election. He stole the election. The Supreme Court stole the election. His brother stole the election. UFO stole the election. It's now legitimate. They challenged his victory. Now, I'm not his biggest fan necessarily, but there's a common denominator here. This is not the first time it happened. When a Republican wins an election, certainly this century, the Democrats refuse to recognize the results. Now, any Republican president who wins an election in, say, let's say 2024, what are the Democrats going to do? Are they going to say, well, he won the election. We should just kind of work with him and do a better job next time. They're going to announce he did not win the election. We should remove him. The next time around, maybe they'll blame China. They'll blame the electrical power grid. They'll blame the high altitude air in Denver. That's what Obama blamed for losing his first debate to Romney. They're always going to have some excuse. And this is kind of what Evan Said referenced. They're kindergartners, they're children. Children never accept responsibility for anything. It's always somebody else's fault. They never legitimately lose an election. So this is now a consistent pattern. Whenever a Republican wins the White House, the Democrats are going to reject the victory. They're going to claim he didn't really win. Now, that's just sour grapes. Maybe we shouldn't take that too seriously. I mean, who cares what whiners think anyway? But when they're no longer just whining, when they're no longer just screaming at the sky in Washington, D.C., when they're actually taking action to seize control of the government, whether it's impeachment, whether it's trying to override President Trump using judicial abuses of power, that's no longer just sour grapes. It's a civil war. And this is really the fundamental question that's before us right now. Who decides who runs the country? Is it the voters who decide? Is it the people who go out and vote who decide that? Or is it some other group of people? Now, for all that the Democrats scream about racism and sexism and transphobia and Islamophobia and all the other identity politics garbage, what this is really about is who runs the country. Is it the voters who run the country or is it their establishment that runs the country? And this is how the Civil War begins. Hopefully it does not end with a shooting war. I certainly would not want a shooting war. But the reality is we are in a power struggle. This is not a power struggle that is going to be settled by elections. You know, I, certainly as the Tea Party movement, you know quite well the frustrating feeling of going out there, of giving it everything, of trying to get the right people elected, and then looking back a year later and going, nothing's changed. Why do we do all this? Why didn't the election actually change anything? And the reality is this is why the election has not changed anything because there's a sizable part of the government that is run by people who don't recognize election results. Now, I come from California. At least I currently come from California. We have a wonderfully diverse political system, the same wonderfully diverse political system as in the Soviet Union. We have one party. You can vote for the Democrats, or you can vote for the Democrats. If you don't like the Democrats, you can vote for the Democrats. And our last Senate race, the one won by Kamala Harris, who is now being tipped as the front-runner for the Democratic nomination for the President of the United States. She won the same kind of competitive election that Barack Obama won to get to the Senate. She won by running against nobody. Or rather, she won by running against Linda Sanchez, who is a fellow Democrat, but who is even more racist than she is. So the voters of California got to choose between one racist and another racist, both of whom are Democrats. That's political diversity for the Democratic Party these days. But this is what they want to do to America. They want there to be a one-party system. You can have any party you want as long as it's a Democrat. That's the old Henry Ford joke. You can have any kind of Model T as long as it's a Model T and as long as it's black. You can have it in any color. You can have California politics in any flavor. And you know, if these people get their way, that's the national politics period. And we're seeing that right now because what does this really come down to? Trump is obviously a very revolutionary candidate and he's really infuriated these people. But the reality is, at this point, they will refuse to recognize any Republican. You know, they ran Mitt Romney last time around. Mitt Romney is nice, he's progressive, he's fairly liberal, and they still made him look like the devil. Uh, John McCain, John McCain, right now they're praising him as the hero who saved Obamacare, but when he ran for office, he was the worst racist who ever existed. He was a horrible monster. At this point, if Lindsey Graham becomes the next Republican presidential candidate, they will discover... If it happens, if it happens, they will discover that he's the worst racist, homophobe, Islamophobe, and the second coming of Hitler. 
You, you pick the most liberal Republican you can imagine. You, you drag out Evans McMullen, and they're still going to make him look like Hitler. Because at this point, that is what they do. And it's not just about anger or bias. It's that they reject the idea that anybody who isn't them can become elected, can run the country. Now, what is that? Communism. It's communism, it's tyranny, it's dictatorship. What we have in de facto is a dictatorship of the Democrats, who are about as democratic as California's democratic. What we have is a dictatorship by people who believe that only they are entitled to run the country. That's what we're up against here. It's not about what Trump said or what he didn't say. It's not about the media wants us to pretend that if he was just nicer about it, if he didn't speak his mind, everything would be good, if he just handled things nicely. You know, we ran candidates who handled things very nicely. We handled Mitt Romney. We had John McCain up there. These are liberal favorites, and they still made them look like the devil. And that's why they got Trump. And that's why if they do succeed in destroying Trump, they should understand that they will get somebody who makes them long for Trump. They will get somebody who makes them nostalgic for Trump. They will get somebody who makes Trump look like John McCain or Lindsey Graham. Because that is what happens. When you have a dictatorship, you also have resistance to the dictatorship. The Democrats like to call themselves the resistance, the hashtag resistance. They're not the resistance. They're the guys who are running the country. Right now, they're the guys who are making all the decisions. They make the decisions within the federal bureaucracy. They do it using federal judges who are unelected officials who insist on imposing their will over those of the electorate. When the people voted for President Trump, they voted for his immigration policies. But you have federal judges announcing, no, you can't actually do that because we're in charge. You know what? We know where this happened before that? It happened in California. In California, people voted against the legal aliens. California judges came out and said, no, we want there to be illegal aliens. And you know how that story ended. California is now a one-party state. What they did to California, what they did to the state of Ronald Reagan, they want to do to America. They want to do it to every state in the union. And they're on their way to doing that. This is part of the challenge that we face because they've rigged the system. Now, when they can do it, they try to rig the system with an appearance of democracy. So they, they love voter fraud. You know what's great about voter fraud? It looks like a legitimate election. Thus, for example, in the Soviet Union, when you had elections, they would have a specific process. So they wouldn't have 100% of the vote being won by Stalin or Khrushchev or whoever. He would win 97% of the vote because there's still some sort of political opposition. Now, that's what's called a controlled political opposition. You could vote yes or you could vote no. So you would, they would record that 96% of the country voted. It's an overwhelming majority. You know, but we still have some freedom because there's 3% who didn't vote. Now, does that remind you of anything in this election? Remind you of the polls for Hillary Clinton? The ones where she was going to win by 80 or 90%? It's the same thing. We have the appearance of a legitimate election, but underneath that appearance, it's a dictatorship. This is what they're implementing. Now, they try to do this under the appearance of democracy. Because when they actually have to break out the brass knuckles, which they're doing with Trump, it starts to look bad. People start to turn against them. People start waking up and going, wait, OK, we voted for this guy, but he's not being allowed to do anything. Aren't we a free country after all? Don't elections matter? They don't want to do that. So they will do voter fraud when they can. They will rig the elections in other ways. So we've been hearing a lot about illegal aliens now and amnesty for illegal aliens. That's one way to do it. Immigration is one way to rig the elections because you can just shift the demographics of entire states. You can bring in these huge populations to completely transform states. They've done that with Virginia. They very much want to do it with Texas. If they succeed in doing it in Texas, then America is over. No Republican is going to win a national election ever again. This is why amnesty might be one of the most crucial issues on the table right now. You've been hearing a lot about crucial issues. They're all very important, but amnesty if illegal alien amnesty does go through, the Democrats are going to have a huge chunk of voters, and they're going to distribute them. They've already distributed them in key areas of the country. They're not just interested in illegal aliens because they're so lovely people, because they're philanthropic, because their heart bleeds for the illegal alien. You know, if those illegal aliens voted Republican by even 60% margin, they would have a wall up yesterday. They would have machine guns on the wall. They would have drones circling the entire border with Mexico, firing heat-seeking missiles. And you know what? It's true. You can tell this in a very easy way, and President Trump referenced this in his 
remark recently. I've talked to immigration lawyers who deal with European immigrants, um, British, French, Belgian, who want to come to America. They have the hardest time ever to come to this country, even though their employment rates are well above. If you look at, for example, the number of French immigrants who came to America, I know France is a fun whipping boy, but 46% of French immigrants who got their um, permanent resident status, 46% of them were employed right away. If you look at the statistics for the countries that Democrats love to bring immigrants from, it's more like 8%. So there's a reason for this. They want people who are going to need them, who are going to be helpless to be on their own, who are going to have to say, give me, give me, give me, give me. If you have immigrants who can actually be self-sufficient, who can stand on their own two legs, they're not going to need the Democrats as much. And you know, it's not like French immigrants are most likely to vote Republican, but at the same time, they're a risk factor. And the Democrats like to play it safe. They like safe bets. That's a major difference between us and them. We just kind of are willing to be open-minded and open-hearted. They have everything absolutely nailed down. They know exactly which immigrant groups are going to vote for them with the highest percentage statistics, and they've rigged the immigration system to benefit them. You know, that's genius on a certain level. I wish, frankly, some of our own people were quite this smart or quite this ruthless about winning. When the Democrats keep winning, when the left keeps winning, it's not accidental. It's not because, well, you know, it's, it's because they've planned every single step of the way. They have a ruthless, focused plan for winning. Everything they do is part of that plan. They don't waste time, you know, for all their emoting, for all their mental breakdowns in public, they are singularly focused on controlling this country. And that's also what the Civil War is about. We now have a civil war between what I call America and un-America. We have two nations, you know, John Edwards and John Kerry like that one. We do have two Americas. We have one America, that's the traditional America. That's the America you're all part of. And we have another America. That's the America that's multinational, that's multicultural, that's cross-border, that really has no regard for the founding fathers, that has no regard for the Constitution, that has no regard even for the entire system of elections. It's not a set of representatives, it's an ideology. It's the ideology of the left. And we're now in a civil war between those people who believe that the leftist ideology should define who runs the country. Now, why is Trump being rejected? Why was Bush's election rejected? Because these people don't believe that elections are a test of who should run the country. And this is really the big thing. Because when you have a civil war, it begins with the question of who, what is the basis for having somebody run the country? And elections are a good system because they're somewhat fair. I mean, they're the worst of all possible systems except for all the other systems. But when you deal with people who don't believe that rejections are a legitimate means of running the country, they believe that ideology is a legitimate means of running the country. Now, you can call that communism, you can call that Islamism, you can call that any other of those totalitarian terms, but the bottom line is we have a civil war between people who believe, as we do, that elections decide who runs the country, and people who believe that their ideology should decide who runs the country. So if somebody who is a non-leftist wins the White House, he's illegitimate because he's not a leftist. He might have won an election, he might have won the election legitimately, he might have won it by X amount of votes. It doesn't matter because he is not a leftist. And that is what the civil war ultimately comes down to. It comes down to the split between the left and between America, between America and between un-America. Now, as I said, they like to operate under the guise of legitimate elections. They prefer having something like Barack Obama where he wins, he appears to win legitimately, and then they can get to the business of transforming the country. Now, the game changes when the Republican wins, and the game really changes when a populist Republican wins, because those are the guys who are never supposed to win. It's, it's one thing if a re establishment Republican wins, we can sort of manage that. They're still going to hate him, they're still going to try to destroy him, but they're going to have a sense of proportion about it. When a populist Republican wins, it rattles them very badly because it suggests to them the one thing that they're very scared of. What are dictators very scared of? What are they frightened of? A revolution, a populist revolution. They're frightened of the idea that the people will wake up and push them out of power. That's why they have the appearance of free elections. Because they want to go through the motions. They want people to just relax, rest, and say, okay, you know, we did a good job. Next time around, we'll try harder. Meanwhile, they rig the game and they rig the system. But when a populist Republican wins, it's an uprising. It's a revolution and it scares them very badly. And then they start bringing out the brass knuckles. Then they panic and they start engaging in violence. And then they start engaging in overt 
dictatorship, over tyranny. Because most of the time, people are comfortable. They think, well, we have a fair set of rules. Republicans win sometimes, Democrats win sometimes. You know, it all evens out in the end. But when Trump wins, and when the entire establishment goes after him, when federal judges insist on ruling that he can't even scratch his own back without their permission, then they start showing their hand, and then people start questioning, do we really have free elections? Do elections even matter? And that's a very scary point. It's an inflection point. It's that point right before a civil war. Because when people are comfortable, they don't feel the need for a civil war. When people start feeling threatened, when they get the sense that the system is broken, or that the system isn't even broken, that the system we thought we knew doesn't even exist, that it's all a lie, that's the point at which they can actually turn to resistance. Now, the left uses resistance, of course, a whole lot, but what the left uses resistance to mean is resistance to anybody who fights against imposing our tyranny. When, a, when individual people and ordinary citizens talk about resistance, what they mean is resistance to government power. So now there's a basic difference between positive rights and negative rights. Now, negative rights sound negative, but as most of you probably know, negative rights are a very good thing. It's the freedoms we have from the government. Freedom of speech is a negative right that we have from the government telling us what we can and can't say. On the other hand, Democrats love positive freedoms because these are entitlements. These are things that the, Democrat, that the Democrats are going to give us. They're going to give us free health care. They're going to give us free phones. They're going to give us the four freedoms so we'll never be free of want, of war, of Obama phones. They're going to take care of us. Now, the freedoms that we care about, the freedoms that we cherish, are freedoms from government. The freedoms that they want to take away are exactly those freedoms. They're going to give us things. You want a free phone? We'll give you a free phone. You want free health care? We'll give you free health care. It will be worth every bit of money that you paid for it, but we'll give it to you. In exchange, we'll just take a few things from you. We'll take your right to free speech. We'll take your right to freedom of the press. I mean the real press, not the mainstream media. And, of course, will take your, away your right to vote. I mean, you can still come up and show up to elections, but the elections won't mean anything. And now with Trump, they're actually overt about saying that elections are inherently illegitimate. Uh, they talk about the Electoral College, they're talking around it a bit, but the bottom line is they're rejecting the idea that elections matter. So when the, when the Democrats lost Congress, that was bad. Then they lost the White House. Now they don't have the White House, they don't have Congress, which means they don't have any of the elected branches of government, and they don't really have the Supreme Court either. So they don't have any of the three elected branches of government. So what did they do in response to that? Exactly, shadow government. So what they did in response to that was, first of all, they began using federal judges to issue orders. Now, those orders eventually get overruled by the Supreme Court much of the time, but in the meantime, you can have a federal judge in San Francisco block the President of the United States from, doing, from implementing the policy that he was elected on, which is, of course, a completely insane state of affairs, but that's how you know that elections to them don't matter. Now, under Obama, when the state tried to enforce immigration laws, right away the Obama administration came in and said, no, you can't enforce immigration laws, and the judges said the same thing, and the Justice Department said the same thing. Now, under President Trump, we've had a complete reversal. Suddenly, they've become advocates of state rights. States can make their own immigration laws. Jerry Brown goes around the country declaring that California is an independent republic. He's signing global warming treaties in China because that's what they believe. So do they, are the Democrats suddenly become born again state riders? No, of course not. Here's the idea. When a Democrat is in the White House, he has unlimited power. He can do absolutely anything at all. He's a ultimate total dictator. When a Republican is in the White House, he can't do anything. He can't even scratch his own back. He has no rights whatsoever. He has no power whatsoever. For example, with DACA, Obama illegally implemented his own version of amnesty. He, didn't go, he did not go through Congress. All that the President Trump's Justice Department did was say, it's not a legal policy. We're not going to go ahead and enforce it. We're not going to go ahead and defend it. And in fact, the federal judges had actually ruled against it. Uh, but now, a federal judge came in again and said that President Trump has no right to suspend an illegal ad hoc policy created by a former administration. Now, what does that really mean? It means that Obama had more power than President Trump did. Now, presidents have actually more power to suspend previous actions than they do to create new ones. Yet this federal judge, and he's backed up by the entire media and the left-wing establishment, insists that actually 
A Democrat has more power in the White House than the Republican does. And this is kind of showing their cards because this is what they actually believe. So when the federal government is dominated by Republicans, they will suddenly talk about state power. Of course, not the state power to keep illegal aliens out, but the state power to let illegal aliens in. When, when, they, when they control the Senate, and the Senate is the wise old body, the sensible guys keeping control of the crazy guys in the House. And then when the Senate goes Republican, suddenly they began screaming, the Senate is a racist, outmoded body, we should get rid of it. You actually see the same writers in the same newspapers making these arguments that are completely contradictory. Why do they do it? Because anything that serves their power is the argument that they will make. They don't actually believe in any of this. They don't care about process, they don't care about procedure, they don't care about the Constitution or about the forms of government. The only thing they care about is power. Anything that serves left-wing power, they will advance. And the argument that serves left-wing power suddenly becomes dominant. Two minutes later when that changes, whoosh, out the door. Remember when the, we should get rid of the filibuster, we should get rid of the filibuster, and then the Republicans are a majority in the Senate and they use the nuclear option, and suddenly, no, the filibuster, we love the filibuster so much. How could you get rid of it? It was the only thing keeping me alive. They will do that all the time. They will completely reverse themselves on a dime because they don't care about the filibuster. They don't care about elections. They care about power. And that has corrupted them. Power corrupts. The desire for power corrupts. And at this point, they exist for power. There's a famous line in Orwell's 1984 that I think explains what we're dealing with quite well. The purpose of power is power. When you believe that the solution to everything is power, then you embrace power wholeheartedly as an end in its own right. And Solinsky does this, for example. Increasingly, the leftists do this. And we've seen this in the Soviet Union, we've seen this in communist China. As they embrace power for its own end, they become complete monsters, they become tyrants. They become completely intolerant of humanity as a whole. Now, let's look back at what our side in the Civil War believes. We've talked a lot about what the enemy believes. Let's talk about our side for a moment. Let's talk about the Founding Fathers. What we have now is professional government. You know, all the people who are very angry with President Trump, he's an amateur, he has no business being in government. Government should be left to professionals. People who have briefcases and badges and security clearances, they know what they're doing. They've been in government since they were 12, and we should trust them to do what's best. And President Trump, who is he? He just showed up on this escalator, and now he's in the White House. This is crazy, and he's got all these people. Who are these people? We don't know who these people are. Tea Party people, no, 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 we need professionals. You know what the founders had thought of professional government? They fought a revolution against it. They fought a revolution against professional government. The British monarchy was a professional government. It was full of government professionals. And then you just had somebody like George Washington. What's George Washington's government experience? None. He was a military guy. And what was Alexander Hamilton's government experience? What was John Adams' government experience? What was Benjamin Franklin's government experience? He runs experiments with lightning and kites. He shouldn't be around government at all. Let him just do his lightning experiments. And all these amateurs came together and they built what we call a volunteer government. That's what America was founded on, was founded on volunteer government. The Society of the Cincinnati, of Hamilton, of Washington, they were... Um, okay. 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 The point was, Cincinnati was a, uh, the city of Cincinnati is named after him. He was a Roman who, when he was needed, he stepped up, he ran the government, and then, unlike all the corrupt Roman emperors who the only way to remove them was to basically set them on fire or to feed them to lions, he actually just went home to his farm. And then, some years later, he did it again. That was the original model in American politics. You came, you served your time, it was a matter of public service, you went home again. You didn't stay in government for life. If you wanted to stay in government for life, you could go to Britain and then you could be part of the monarchy, you could become a lord. In America, we didn't have lords. We didn't have professional government, we did not have permanent government. Now, a lot of people wonder why the Republican establishment is so rotten. It's so rotten because it's a professional government. Now, professional government, by its very nature, believes in perpetuating itself. So even when they come in, they make various pledges around election time, then they go back to Washington, D.C., and they do whatever serves the permanent government. And what we're fighting for 
citizen government, citizen volunteer government, that's what you represent, that's what the Tea Party represents, that's what activism represents. When citizens go out, they get involved and they make a difference, that's the opposite of professional government, and that's why the Tea Party will always be the enemy of this establishment, it will always be at war with this. Because the professional government is by its nature going to be a dictatorship. It might not start out as a dictatorship. It doesn't have to start out as a dictatorship, but it will become inevitably a dictatorship. And if you think about what professional government is, it's easy to understand why it will always become a dictatorship. Because well, what are we seeing with Trump right now? You can't have amateurs running the government. You can't just let elections determine who gets to run the country. I mean, what if they vote for the wrong guy? We're going to have to do something about that. We're going to have to impeach him. We're going to have to investigate him. We're going to have to eavesdrop him on him. We're going to have to eavesdrop on his people. We're going to have to bring him down. Then we're going to have to put in the sort of person who always belonged there all along, like Hillary Clinton or Lindsey Graham, somebody who is part of the professional political class, who is now one of those rogue amateur volunteers. I mean, if these people were around during George Washington's first term, they would drive him out of office because he doesn't know how to play the game. And that's what it's about. So even the Republican establishment types are there to play the game. They're very threatened by somebody who doesn't play the game, who doesn't listen to them, who doesn't follow their received wisdom, but who decides what is right based on common sense. And we were a country founded on common sense. It's one of those things that isn't mentioned in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, but common sense is one of those fundamental virtues. Because when you have a popular government, or rather when you have a volunteer government, it's built on common sense. It's built on people using their common sense to do the right thing. When you have a professional government, it's built on theories. And I know who's really good at theories of government? The left. The left is fantastic at theories of government. The left has, has 20,000 theories of government. All of them fail horribly, and all of them end with famine, starvation, mass murder, but they've got such fantastic theories. Right now in Venezuela, anybody visited Venezuela recently? Well, you could get a really great deal there because their exchange for dollars is about 131,000 bolivars to the dollar. So you can be as poor as you like, you can be a billionaire in Venezuela. Unfortunately, a cup of coffee goes to around 35,000 bolivars. And that's, by the way, it's a new strong bolivar that they implemented to replace the old weak bolivar. Now, what went wrong in Venezuela? Do you know who their finance minister is in Venezuela? Who's the most qualified guy a leftist would think should run the economy? A sociologist. And he's not just a sociologist, he's a leftist sociologist who believes that inflation doesn't exist. Now, Venezuela has currently hit about 4,000% inflation. It might hit 200,000% inflation by the end of the year. But it's such a great theory, swayed by the facts. So the left is really great at theories of government. The Obama administration had lots of fantastic theories. We're going to empower the Muslim Brotherhood. We're going to have free health care for everybody. These should work great in theory. They don't work so well in practice because common sense actually tests things in practice. Evan Said was talking before about the difference between people who talk for a living and people who do things for a living. When you do things for a living, you can actually tell if something works or not. You can tell if the toilet works or not. You can tell if the plane works or not. On the other hand, if you talk a lot, then you get the idea that the things in your head are absolutely real and that they should run the government based around those things. That's how the left does things. That's how the professional class does things. See, the professional class is really stupid. They're stupid in the way that only smart people can be stupid. So stupid people can be stupid in very basic ways. Stupid people can accidentally set themselves on fire while trying to cook dinner. Smart people set a million people on fire because they think that you're going to really improve the food production industry if you just set a million people on fire because then you have less mouths to feed. So there's a basic difference there, and this is how the left does things. The left is the essence of professional government. The left's entire ambition is to be professional government. It's to run the country from head to toe. And Republicans who are into professional government end up inevitably drifting to the left because there are two opposite poles in the Civil War. There's volunteer government and there's professional government. When you're on the side of professional government, you will inevitably drift toward tyranny. You will inevitably drift toward the left. It's why so many of these never-Trumpers were so quick to end up on the side of the left, to end up sounding like leftists, because they were kind of in their camp all along. Because when you believe that professionals should run things, you believe in tyranny. And that's what we're up against here. We're up in a civil war between those people who believe in the government of the founders, a volunteer government, and those people who believe that the professionals should run things. 
qualified professionals, not people like you and me, not Grandma Sally, certainly not President Trump. They should be people who have a degree from the right school of politics. They are people who should have the right qualifications. They should have worked in the senator's office and then in the governor's office. They should know Bob and they should know Bill and they should know Steve. And then they're qualified to run the country. They might not understand anything. They might have no common sense whatsoever, but they understand how Washington, D.C. runs. And Washington, D.C. is its own science. You can be a physics professor, you can be a general, but you can still have no clue whatsoever about how Washington, D.C. runs. Because that's what professional government does. It creates these complex power structures. Now, some people call that the deep state or the shadow government. You can use any name you want, but the reality is, what I call Washington, D.C. personally, is the imperial city. It's Rome. You go there, it's an entirely different civilization. And that's the civilization that runs our lives. And that civilization got a shock to its system when President Trump won the election. And they've been trying to bring them down ever since. Other people have talked about the Mueller investigation or the various other investigations. But they all come down to the same thing. The people in Washington, D.C., the professional government, the ones who run the country, the ones who don't just serve their term and then go back home, even if they lose the election, they become lobbyists, they stay in Washington, D.C. full time. They believe in running the country and they are not about to give that up. And this is the civil war we're fighting now. For now, we can still settle the war maybe with elections, but the reality is we're entering that window where elections are no longer enough. Right now, we have federal judges saying that President Trump isn't allowed to do this or isn't allowed to do that based on one of his tweets. How long until a federal judge says that somebody like President Trump isn't allowed to run for office or isn't allowed to take office because of one of his tweets? Now, that seems far-fetched, right? Can you see that happening? It can absolutely happen. In fact, it's happened at some local levels already. It happens in Europe all the time. Certain parties are excluded from even being allowed to compete. And that's what they're actually headed toward. We're going to have the California one-party system, whether we want it or not. We're going to have a light rail to nowhere, whether we want it or not. We're going to have illegal aliens, whether we want it or not, because that's what the professional government types want, because that allows them to run the country. That's what it's really about. And so we're now entering what may be the final stages of the nonviolent part of the Civil War. I don't want it to be a shooting war, but right now we're at the very twilight of this. Because the system, whether you quote the deep state, the shadow government, or anything, they're coming out of the shadows now. They're being more open about what they want. They're being clear about saying, we don't believe that elections determine who should run the country. We should run the country. And when somebody says that to you, what they really want is a dictatorship. That's the challenge. We know what they're fighting for. We know what we're fighting against. We need to do our best to fight. Now, for a lot of people, President Trump's victory changed everything, and it was an amazing moment. I was right there with you, watching the results come in state by state. But we didn't win the country. You know, we've won elections before. All of you who have been involved in politics have had this experience. You win an election, but then you look back a year, two, three years later, where did all this go? It's the people on the ground who make the difference. One man alone is not going to change everything. We, all of us, need to stay engaged, we need to stay active, we need to keep fighting. And this is how the left does things. People often ask me, why is the left so successful? The left doesn't just say, we elected Obama, we elected um, Bill Clinton, we can go home now. No, they build the infrastructure, they come in, they go out, day in, day out. You know those crazy leftist protesters screaming at the sky? They're nuts, but you have to admire them on some level because there's a commitment there. There's a commitment with the Women's March. They're going to go out there in huge numbers, day in, day out, to fight for what they believe in. And what they believe in is that we should have no rights whatsoever. Now, if they're willing to fight this hard to take away our rights, we should be fighting twice as hard to keep our rights. Thank thank, you for, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the fight you've been putting up. Thanks to Joe for putting all this together. And keep up the good fight.